Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's live broadcast, Impact of the cobus liat Flu Assay on Clinical Decision-Making in the Emergency Department, Plague Study Group. I am Brenda Kelly Kim of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's webcast is presented by LabRoots.com, the leading social media site for science professionals and sponsored by Roche Diagnostics. As a global leader in healthcare, Roche Diagnostics offers a broad portfolio of tools that help healthcare providers in the early detection, prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of diseases. In molecular diagnostics, we are driven by a vision of working with laboratories like yours to improve the medical value you offer in microbiology, infectious diseases, oncology, and genomics. We continue to meet unmet needs through our investment in research, innovation, and scientific excellence with the goal of supporting your important role in patients' lives. Before we start, we have a few instructions. We want to hear from you during this interactive broadcast, so please ask questions or leave us a comment. Answers welcome too. You can do this by hitting the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window and typing in your comments and questions. We'll try to get to as many as we can, and we'll follow up if we don't have time today. Want a better look? You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you can't hear this presentation properly, let us know by clicking on the support button on the top right, or use the Q&A button, and we'll make sure we try to resolve any issues. Now let's get right to today's presenter. We are proud to welcome Dr. Glenn Hansen. Dr. Hansen is the Director of Clinical Microbiology and Molecular Diagnostics at Hennepin County Medical Center in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and an Assistant Professor in the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology and Department of Medicine at the University of Minnesota. He is an active member of the American Society for Microbiology, the Academy of Clinical Laboratory Physicians and Scientists, the Association for Molecular Pathology, the Association of Medical Microbiology and Infectious Diseases of Canada, and the Infectious Disease Society of America. Dr. Hansen? To you about uh, influenza. It may be kind of strange to be talking about the flu season during summer, but we know that the influenza outbreaks that we see every year uh, clearly cross to areas of the country and, and time frames in which we've seen influenza outbreaks. So I'm happy to be with you today to talk to you about our experience with a new diagnostic test in our emergency department last year. Uh, so with that, I would like to extend my uh, appreciation to LabRoots uh, and the invitation um, for being here today. I have one disclosure. Um, some of the data that we're gonna show you today was supported by an unrestricted investigator initiated unrestricted educational grant from Roche. Uh, to generate some of the data that we used in our emergency department last year. So the purpose of today's talk is really to look at five distinct areas to discuss why influenza is always a discussion for both clinical laboratory communities and hospital networks each year. Why do we continue to hear issues about influenza? What options are available for testing in influenza series? Uh, rapid tests, molecular tests, panel tests, where do these uh, new diagnostic frontiers uh, capture in the clinical diagnostic community? Uh, and there is a new option for influenza testing this year that we'd like to introduce you to. Uh, it's a test system that we had some experience with last year uh, called the roche cobas liot that we'll uh, introduce you to. But beyond that, really what we're going to focus on here today is the theoretical question of whether or not testing can impact patient management particularly in the emergency department setting, and share with you some of our experiences. Uh, we like to think as laboratorians that the testing that we offer has a direct impact to patient care. Um, so we'd like to explore that discussion a little further. And finally, to talk about testing and impacting outcomes. In this modern day of healthcare management, where we spend our money and how we spend our money wisely with diagnostic tests that can really impact outcome of patients is a key area of discussion going forward. So with that, I'd like to introduce you to the influenza virus. Uh, each year we get influenza that occurs in distinct outbreaks, uh, varying extent every year. The epidemiological pattern of the influenza reflects the changes in nature's of antigenetic properties of the virus. 
and the subsequent spread and virulence that we see each year of influenza uh, is directly re related to some of the transmissibility properties as these virus shift. So every year as laboratory and communities, we gear up for flu season. We talk about extending coverage of testing uh, to help our healthcare systems. Uh, we look at it and typically when we talk about influenza, we'll see a figure like this that is put up here, uh, schematic of the virus. And we know that each year influenza remains a moving target, both for diagnostics as well as therapeutic, as well as vaccine development, because we know our virus shifts. Um, we know that the antigenetic properties of the virus, the virulence that we see, the diagnostic capabilities of detecting the virus are often dependent on changes that we see in surface proteins, particularly hemagglutinin and neuraminidase. Uh, changes to hemagglutinin allow different viruses to bind to sialic re acid receptors on epithelial cells in different fashions. We know that our molecular tests target largely matrix proteins inside the virus, but it's those changes to the virus each year that give us some of the discussion points going forward to talk about influenza. When we see mo small minor changes, small minor mutational events that occur in the virus, we refer to those as antigenetic drift. When we see large reassortment of the viruses and the so-called terminologies that we hear, H1N1 as an example, H1N5, when we see large reassortment of the viruses within human and animal communities, then we refer to that as antigenetic, antigenetic drift. And all of these properties come together to allow us to be able to look at the way in which we treat patients, diagnose, and, and protect patients against influenza every year. Whoops, I went back a slide. So moving forward, it's interesting to note that this is a slide published last year in MMWR looking at the influenza rates, the epidemic rates that we had seen over the last five years. Um, when we calculate epidemic thresholds, epidemiologists will look at mortality rates of the virus as represented by largely 1.6 standard deviations above a mortality rate that represents a threshold. And what you can see is that over the last four or five seasons, we've had distinct patterns in which the influenza season has reached epidemic thresholds. This puts tremendous pressure both on healthcare communities, healthcare systems, as well as diagnostic labs to meet the demand for incoming flu seasons. We know that incidence rates, this is some of our own local data provided to us by our great State Department of Health in the state of Minnesota, looking at some of the incidence rates that we had seen over the last few years. Last year in particular, 2014, 2015, was a particularly large year for the state of Minnesota. And many of you have had similar experiences where you get calls from emergency department, from pediatric settings saying that we're seeing a lot of flu. So the theoretical questions of why tests for flu often come up, and we're gonna circle around to this, but we do hear these discussions during the height of flu season, if a patient presents to the emergency department or to an outpatient clinic with signs of fever and signs of symptoms of influenza, it's probably influenza. Why do we need to test for flu? And these are just some of the issues, discussion points to talk about. We know that testing for flu can help guide treatment courses. We know that antibiotics are often over-administered in cases when they shouldn't be, and we wanna be able to be judicious in the use of antivirals that we provide for upcoming flu seasons. The CDC has numerous recommend recommendations for who gets antiviral treatment, and there's large debate over these. We know that over the years, there have been some debates over who gets the antiviral treatments, what cohorts should we look at it for. We truthfully probably don't give enough antivirals to patients that we see, but you can see some of the populations that we see here. Severe or complicated courses, those requiring hospitalization, those at extreme age groups, long-term care facilities, uh, aminosuppressive therapies, those of uh, specific ethnic origins. These are all recommendations by the CDC to help guide treatment um, for flu. We also know that testing definitively for flu can help support empiric antibiotic coverage for admitted patients. We hope that it can help guide admission and discharge changes in orders, and we hope that influenza diagnostics can help guide subsequent procedures. If we can definitively identify influenza and provide a diagnosis, does it prevent subsequent test orders, lab orders, and even procedures, imaging and things like that? We know it's helpful to the medical staff in helping to predict course as well. As with any diagnostic modality, we know that if we can help to predict a course and with a diagnosis that it's helpful to families in the communities. So we know that there are a number of reasons to test for influenza um, to help predict cohorting in hospitals, and it's useful for patients to know as well. 
So there are a number of reasons to test for flu. But again, we come back to this central issue. Does any of the testing that we do make a difference? And that's going to be a central theme going forward. So there are many things that we can do in the clinical laboratory. Um, testing is one of them. This is just one of the photos that I saw last year at a local grocery store that I thought I'd share with you. Uh, we all have our part in helping with influenza season. Uh, this is just one of them. But beyond that in the laboratory, we clearly have an armament now of ways to test for influenza virus, new tools that are disposable that we frankly have never had before, from the large multiplex viral panels to PCR-based tests to the new generation of rapid assays, to our point of care deliveries, to even cell culture and direct fluorescent antigen-based tests. What is the proper way to test for flu remains a theoretical discussion and is largely dependent on variables that influence one's own healthcare system. But this is just some of the armament that, at, that is at our disposal for how we test for flu. When one looks at the data, we can see that not all testing is equivalent. Um, this was a study performed a few years ago by Christine Ginocchio in New York, looking at the sensitivities in 2009, again, this was the height of the H1N1 outbreak, of some of the rapid tests that were at their, in, at their, their disposal at the time of looking at it. And you can see that not all tests perform equally. The other thing that you note is that it's very difficult to argue for testing that meets a minimum sensitivity bar below 50%. It's very difficult to argue for that testing. And part of the reason I'm showing this slide is this slide was really a, a key sentinel slide in my career in terms of being able to advocate for a way of the use of the rapids on campus. I've since come a little bit softer and full circle on the use of some of the newer generation uh, rapid assays, but you can see that not all testing is performed equal. Well, what about the use of the rapid panel tests, the comprehensive tests that can look for 16, 17, in some cases, 21 different circulating respiratory viruses? Uh, these assays clearly have a role in our diagnostic armamentarium, and we use them for our inpatient admissions, our transplant units, our areas in which we need to know definitively the circulating virus composition in a, in a potential patient. This is just one additional publication done by Melissa Miller's group in the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, looking at some of the sensitivity of some of the multiplex panel-based testing. Uh, in this series, they looked at sensitivity as a comparison of two of the three positive nucleic acid tests that could detect an assay, um, detect a virus. And once again, you see that these test um, platforms perform very well, but you can notice that it takes time to get these results and the actionable event of being able to diagnose influenza virus when the patient is in front of you is limited by the use of these tests. So the debate over the ideal influenza test, I've used this quote, borrowed this quote, stole this quote from some colleagues of mine who have published on C. diff related issues, but we're reminded from Wyatt Earp that fast is fine, but accuracy is everything. And we're really looking for diagnostic assays that can provide us with an actionable event with a standalone result that we know is definitive. So over the years, the testing and the debate for the ideal influenza test has typically been a balance between sensitivity and speed. Over the last few years, that debate has typically debated over how much are we willing to pay as not only laboratories, but as healthcare systems for the access to the speed of that testing and where that testing is more or less likely to result in actionable events. I'm putting this slide up here just as a reminder. This is the CDC's guidance to professionals, to clinician guidance for algorithms for looking at the way in which we determine the use of rapid influenza testing. And you can see from this figure here that they're basically letting us know that where the test is positive and where the test is negative, that we should be looking at signs and symptoms. Once again, advocating for the use of the clinical direction because we know some of our rapid tests have historically lacked the sensitivity that we've come to expect from the larger core laboratory facilities who can offer the testing. So that brings us to the point of the new test that we like to show you. Uh, this is a new test on the market. Some of you have heard of this test, the cobas liat test. Um, and this is a new test presented by Roche. The next few slides are courtesy of Roche, uh, provided to me from Roche to kind of elaborate and illustrate what the test is. So the test is a standalone analyzer. It is a molecular true cycling PCR that actually cycles um, in a molecular platform. A pencil sized flexible tube is inserted into the instrument. The tube can only go in one directional, unidirectional. We fill it up with the viral transport media that we use to inoculate um, the tube that we collect from, from suspension. 
The interesting thing about this assay is that this assay uses a actuator with all chemicals stored on board that allow us to be able to cycle at a very, very rapid rate. That rate allows us to be able to offer a molecular test, a reverse transcriptase PCR for influenza virus in less than a 25 minute, less than a 30 minute threshold. The, t the analytical test time for detection of influenza on the instrument is approximately 20 to 22 minutes. And it's this actuation process that allows the cooling and thermal cycling processes to really be sped up to the point where it can break that 30 minute threshold. For those of you that know what I'm talking about, when we brought about molecular tests, we often think about cycles of molecular tests. And historically, we've been looking at one degree per ramp per degree per second. That sounds very technical. What are we talking about? Well, for, well, for a typical 40 to 45 cycle or 30 to 35 cycle assay, we're typically restricted to one minute per cycle, which typically allows our molecular assays to be offered at somewhere around that 35, 45, 50 minute threshold. Uh, this technology allows us to speed that process up quite substantially. It's got heating and cooling elements, controlled temperatures, uh, motion sensors in the assay that are all preset. Uh, the optical system then can read individual channels for both an influenza A, an influenza B target, as well as an internal control that is all on board in the test. The test is fully complete. It packs everything that you need to be able to run the PCR reaction. It's one stop closed tube system that includes all the magnetic bead-based extractions, the lysis buffers, the protonase K, the elution buffers, and all the PCR reagents required to do PCR, all in a flexible uh, platform uh, single tube uh, device. The company currently has claims for both strep A as well as influenza A and B on the system. So the key question that I want to keep circling down to is, can access to rapid, reliable, molecular-based influenza testing in the emergency department change practice management. So when we heard about access to this test, we, con we contracted some of the folks through the independent grant association that Roche carries to be able to look at a grant that would allow us to sample the use of the test in a high throughput emergency department setting. Uh, Hennepin County Medical Center has a very large, uh, very well-known uh, national emergency medicine to program emergency the medicine department. We see roughly 110,000 ED visits a year, and we thought it would be a good opportunity to look at the use of modern contemporary diagnostics. So we got together a group that we formed into a study that we referred to as the CLADE study, the clinical decision making in the emergency department setting, using the use of this test at the patient-centered level. So we are fortunate enough to have a laboratory, an emergency department laboratory. It's run under the larger laboratory CLIA license. Many of you have an emergency department or a satellite lab associated with your emergency department. We looked at it over three months during the 2015 season uh, in approximately 314 patient visits. Uh, we were fortunate enough to be able to tap into the medical students and the residents uh, that are associated with our hospital in the University of Minnesota um, that allowed us to incorporate a 24-7 study enrollment. The best way to interpret whether or not a test is actually making a difference in actionable events for a physician is to simply ask them. So our medical students and residents were fortunate enough to, to feed them and provide them with the opportunity to be involved in a study. We're able to admission, administer a five-page survey to the uh, admitting physician when a patient came in. We had 150 patients enrolled in the series that provided a, in addition to the history and physical, a detailed study, um, five-page survey was administered that asked the provider very key specific questions. What is the likelihood of flu in your patient? What symptoms does your patient have? What is your initial management course? Are you gonna give them antipyretics? Are you going to admit them? Are you going to give them imaging? Are you gonna order chest films? Are you gonna provide antimicrobials? Are you gonna give them Tamiflu? Very specific pointed questions related to their history and physical exam that we could track. The changes that were made in patient management as a result of the test, so as the study was being administered and the survey was being given, we were running the influenza test in the emergency department clinical lab. We included cases that met our 45 minute bar window, which allowed us to look at 150 patients. When the test result from the lab came back, the same provider that provided the initial history and physical and provided the initial assessment was given a follow-up survey and asked, did the result of rapid influenza test change anything on your management?
and test characteristics of the assay were performed compared to the Genmark assay to look at all the, the analytics that the lab community likes to look at, sensitivity, specificity. But what we were really interested in looking at is whether or not the clinicians could document changes in, as a result in management of their patients as a result of the test. Now it's important to know that all of the changes that were documented by the provider in the second follow-up survey had to be traceable to the electronic medical record. I'm not a big fan of survey-based studies because um, anybody can frankly do them and they're often biased. Oh gee, Dr. Hansen's a good guy. I know a few people in the emergency department. I'll click yes on his survey. And so we needed to track that any changes that a provider noted could be traced directly to the medical record. What do I mean by that? Well, if a provider said, I'm going to admit the patient because I'm very concerned about the influenza status in the patient, and the test result came back and was influenza negative, and the provider decided, well, I think you could probably go home. We don't probably need to admit you based on your influenza status. That change had to be documented in EPIC. We needed to be able to go, which is our electronic medical record. We needed to be able to go back into the electronic medical record and see the initial order for an antibiotic, an antiviral, an admission, and then see that order changed in order to count it in our study. So how do we know how test has an impact? These are some of the questions that were asked to the providers upon the initial presentation of the patient in the emergency department with influenza-like symptoms. We asked about the clinical suspicion for flu. We asked about the clinical symptoms. Does your patient have fever? Do we see hemoptysis? Do we see some of these issues that, that associate with the influenza-like illness? What is on your history and physical differential? What else is included in your, in your differential other than influenza? Does this person have an exacerbation of, of uh, COPD? What is your initial care and plan for the patient? Are you going to administer therapy? Are you going to administer procedures? And do you plan to admit the patient? When the test result returned, a pointed series of 15 targeted questions were asked to providers based on the initial assessment. This is just some of the questions that were asked. Did the result of the influenza test change your management? Will an admission discharge order be changed? Will a, will a patient receive anti-therapeutic agents in a different form now? Will you add additional lab tests? Will you DC additional lab tests? To get an indication of how the tests being delivered in a fashion within a 40, 45 minute time frame could impact management of influenza patients in the emergency department setting. And this is some of our results. What we noticed was that in 150 documented patients, we saw changes in patient management in almost 60% of the cases. 50% of the time, the providers noted a change that could be documented to the electronic medical record as a result of having access to rapid influenza testing in the emergency department setting. The other thing that's somewhat interesting, but probably not surprising to the laboratory community, is that over half of those cases in which a management change occurred in a patient were as a result of a negative influenza test. And there's lots of discussion these days about point of care for microbiology, about where we are likely to best operationalize our resources, our limited resources in healthcare dollars, in laboratory expenditure, and in laboratory personnel. But the best candidate for a test in which we can make an argument for is a test that has clinical decision points resulting on both positive and negative test results. So what this figure shows here is that over half, 61% of the cases in which a management change was documented occurred as a result of confidence in a negative influenza test result. So what were the changes that we had seen? And what were the changes that were documented by the providers recordable in the electronic medical record? Well, not surprisingly, 53% of the documented changes to antiviral antimicrobial stewardship occurred. The way that we use our anti-infective agents is largely dependent on the accuracy and the timeliness in which the laboratory can deliver diagnostic results for infectious related issues. 17% of our changes also occurred in changes to admission order sets. Either patients were not going to be initially admitted or they were going to be initially admitted and the result of the influenza test in conjunction with the larger clinical picture allowed providers to change order sets for admission or discharge. And we'll talk about the significance of that finding in a few slides. 19% of the changes that we saw 
occurred in changes to procedures in the lab. As you can see, sometimes this goes both ways. If we diagnose influenza, sometimes it results in additional tests being ordered, where now we have additional chest films being ordered because we're concerned about pneumonia. Um, so there are 19% of the cases that we saw, we saw changes to pr additional procedures and additional orders. We have one case in our series for note in which the differential included meningitis on a 14 year old girl that came into the emergency department. Upon testing for influenza, the clinical team decided that the positive influenza result probably negated a spinal tap on that individual. So you can see the cascade of events that occur as a result of access to positive and negative test results in the system. I mentioned this before, that this is an example of one of the figures from the CDC's initiative to healthcare providers of how to deal with influenza during the influenza season. And you can see here that this is a question that we've asked is can clinical symptoms impression alone diagnose influenza with any degree of accuracy? Why do we need laboratory testing at all? We hear it every year from colleagues, from providers, from uh, guideline-based approaches. Um, if a patient presents with influenza-like illness, the likelihood during flu season that that person has flu is probably pretty strong. Do we really even need testing at all to be able to diagnose influenza? And you can see even with the guidance from the CDC, based on some of the difficulties with the rapid test results, the actionable events are to use clinical signs and symptoms and history as information with which patient management approaches will continue for patients that have influenza. So a philosophical question would be, if we added up all these clinical symptoms alone, how well would providers do in diagnosing influenza? Well, because our survey asked that question directly, what is the likelihood that your patient has influenza? We were actually able to go back and chart that. And what we found was when providers indicated that this patient fell into a very high risk, and I think the probability of this patient having influenza based on clinical symptoms alone was high, it turns out they were right only 36% of the time. We know that looking at fever gave us a clinical sensitivity during last year's flu season of only 30%, and that the clinical sensitivity of no fever was almost identical. So what does all of this data mean? Does this mean that providers are only 36% sensitive in diagnosing flu from clinical symptoms alone? Well, there's lots of debates to have from this, but it's interesting to remember our experience in our study of 36% sensitivity because that number is exactly the same as a very recent publication done out of Johns Hopkins that looked at the exact same issue. When they looked at back and looked at the clinician's perspective of the clinical diagnosis and how well the clinical diagnosis correlated to a diagnosis of influenza based on a gold standard of lab testing sensitivity. 36% is the exact same number that we found in our series. So it's food for thought, it's pause for caution perhaps, that the clinical symptoms that we're seeing each year with changes in influenza status really are difficult for providers in very high risk areas and very large areas where we're trying to triage patients through um, with any degree of accuracy and certainty. In this series here, the ILI, the influenza-like case definition uh, was less sensitive than the clinical diagnosis, but still did not approach 50%. So our experience, the raw laboratory analytical experience, we're still kind of um, debating some of the, the correlative data of this. There's a couple of discrepancies we're looking at, but we had 314 cases that we were able to analyze. 150 of those cases met our patient criteria for being able to have clinical documentation changes tracked through the electronic medical record. But we had 314 cases in which we looked at the cobas layout over flu season last year, including 82 positive. Um, three of them, we used the Genmark RVP panel. Um, Dr. Miller, as I showed earlier in the slide, has previously shown that that panel is a very sensitive, very specific assay on the market. And you can see that anytime you do a comparative study, there's a couple of stragglers that we have to work out here. We're still in the process of looking at those to see whether or not those are sample distribution issues, if we would just we split the specimen too many times, or whether or not there was actually influenza RNA in the sample. Um, but the sensitivity of our assay performed very well. 
the sensitivity of the package insert from the manufacturer sh is shown before as well, where we can see sensitivity of 100% for both flu A and flu B. It's also important to note the strong sensitivity of flu B. Historically, many of the assays on the market, including ones that I've used in our practice, have faltered with sensitivities of flu B. Flu B often becomes a more difficult diagnostic target to look at. It's also potentially a more difficult treatment target to look at as well. There's a number of very well done series, including a very well done study in Tokyo, looking at the efficacy of the antiviral treatment for influenza B at a statistically lower and clinically significant lower rate than we see for influenza A. So when you look at sensitivity of the assays that you're looking at, influenza A and influenza B sensitivity is important to understand. The impact of co-circulating viruses is also a hot topic. We've learned much about the role of co-circulating viruses. We thought we'd share this with you. We found a respiratory virus, which included flu, but a respiratory virus in over half in over 53% of all of the cases we encountered in the emergency department last year. So we are starting to see the impact of some of these circulating virus. A slide like this points to the value of being able to understand what viruses are actually present in our very, very sick patients, our very compromised patients, our transplant patients. The influenza virus was detected in 44 of all of the cases we encountered, and a second respiratory virus was detected in over a quarter of all of the cases we had seen. The, e, the ED physician's involvement in the assay and in diagnostic testing is really important as well. And so we were able to go back prospectively and ask the providers in real time about the satisfaction of the test that they were looking at. Satisfaction is becoming kind of a hot term. We're looking at it in regards to patient satisfaction, but also provider satisfaction in terms of the services that we deliver from the lab. Not surprisingly, we had a very strong support of the test in our emergency department. Uh, what's really interesting to me about the patient satisfaction responses are the cases in which we found uh, providers were not happy with the test. Most of those incidences were around cases in which the test result could not be delivered within the 35 to 45 minute period. And it's one thing to keep in mind as we bring tests like this into our environment is that most of these are single box tests that require us to put one sample in at a time. So when we look at the way in which we deliver influenza testing in our communities and in our practice, we need to be cognizant of surge capacity and the ability for us to get assays on the market and get samples through um, that meet certain degrees of, of volume that we would expect to see in certain areas. So what does all this mean? We talked about the analytical sensitivity. We talked about the value of testing. We even showed you some of the data that proved that the testing that we had performed in the emergency department last year had clinically actionable events. But there are two key questions that need to be asked. The first is, is what is the effect of all this testing on our healthcare dollar, dollars? And is smarter expenditure really a solution? So I'm going to give you a little bit of insight into some data that we're continuing to mine as part of our study that we hope to be able to present at the uh, Association for Molecular Pathology meeting in a couple of months. We know from some very large studies done and funded by the AHRQ that have looked at the costs for hospital stays in the United States. This is a very difficult slide to read, but this little purple arrow here highlights the fact that we're seeing positive admissions, increases in admission for patients that have codes for pneumonia. And we're seeing pneumonia become a, a larger, larger issue in our hospital systems. Over the last couple of years, we know that there's a, almost a 7% increase in hospital stays that include a diagnosis of pneumonia from an emergency department setting. So there are a number of ways in which hospitals bill and recoup costs associated with pneumonia. We also know from another very well done AHRQ document that the average cost of admitting somebody with a simple diagnosis of pneumonia that would exclude TB, that would exclude HIV, a simple diagnosis of pneumonia from an emergency department setting typically costs a healthcare organization about $10,000 a diagnosis. We know that there are a number of DRG codes that we can apply to diagnosis to allow hospital systems to be able to recoup costs associated with a initial diagnostic uh, grouping code.
um, the complexity of these codes add various values to what hospitals are essentially allowed to charge, allowed to bill. And you can see some of the numbers here, but some of them you clearly note that what we can recoup is less than what the AHRQ has established as the principal diagnosis of pneumonia. If we're costing, uh, the cost of a hospital bed is $10,000 for the simple admission, and we can only recoup $5,000 of that, you can see that it's costing us more money in this current healthcare climate to treat patients than what hospitals can recoup. So where does this all come in? Well, this is some data that we're working on with a healthcare economics group to look at healthcare economics, economics outcomes associated with the data set that we were able to generate. But just to show you superficially some of the incidents that we're looking at is we're looking at the use of tests as cost diversion, cost diversion tools in our total healthcare dollars. Where can we reallocate healthcare dollars in a more clinically responsible, financially responsible fashion? We know that the simple cost of a diagnosis for pneumonia is about $10,000 a case. In the 65 days we performed our analysis, 15 documented cases were seen where hospital admission changes were changed, where we would have admitted a patient, but that patient was now discharged as part of the larger clinical picture, including the access to the rapid influenza result. If you just do some simple math, you start to see how the numbers start to generate where you can potentially look at a cost diversion of $150,000 in 65 days in a very high emergency department, high throughput, high incident season of influenza. We also know that the, core, the ability to judiciously use our antivirals and anti-infectives also has a role. Every hospital now likely has antimicrobial stewardship committees that have been gathered, that have been mandated in many cases by CMS, by JCO by regulatory authorities to look at the way in which antimicrobials are provided and given and used at healthcare facilities. So the ability for diagnostic tests to either confirm or support the original use of anti-infectives is important as well. And we estimate that 33 cases of Tamiflu, in fact, we documented 33 cases of Tamiflu were DC'd in our, in our 65 day um, uh, trial with use of the test which had a cost diversion of over another $3,000. So we're looking at the ways in which testing can help with cost diversion in, in our overall healthcare dollars. So the summary and conclusions. We know that rapid access to sensitive flu testing in the emergency department environment was associated with changes in patient managements to both a clinically significant and a statistically significant level. We know that 53% of the documented changes we observed in our series involve changes to anti-infective treatment. And the changes in admission and discharge orders accounted for 17% of all the evaluable cases. But those 17% were the largest cost diversions that we could obtain in our series. And that 23% of all the documented changes um, in initial management occurred as a result of access to rapid flu testing. So the cobos liot assay truly represents a rapid, sensible, sensitive, adaptable assay for the delivery of influenza results that can impact patient care. It's somewhat ironic that for the last decade, laboratory communities have been clamoring for a rapid, adaptable, molecular, standalone result box, standalone assay that would allow us to deliver testing in clinically actionable events closer to patients. And now we have one on the market. So my final thoughts as we get to the end of this presentation are just to talk about the philosophical barriers of point of care applications for influenza testing. There's no question that the delivery of healthcare in our current climate is about to change. We're looking at models that are based on preventative medicine rather than to have people present to our hospitals. In many cases, if people present to our emergency departments, we've done a bad job. Can we prevent actionable events in larger settings outside of the traditional models of where we typically looked at where testing is done, i.e. a core centralized molecular or microbiology laboratory. And to remind us of where we've come and the potential of where we might go, we look back to the early 90s of where we were with point of care testing and post anesthesia care units as a result of access to blood gases, to sodiums, to potassiums, and very well done studies that showed that the analytical transport time really was a barrier in terms of being able to deliver 
accurate results to patients. Historically for microbiology, our barrier and our bar has been our familiarity and our comfort level with the sensitivity and the specificity of the testing that we allowed to leave the laboratory. But these discussions are worth having. There's lots of testing, there's plenty of testing to go around. The discussions of where testing is more likely to provide actionable events are key discussion points going forward for both the laboratory, but specifically the microbiology community going forward. So the final thoughts is access to testing enough to impact patient outcome. It's the integration of test results with the physician at the bedside at the level at which the history and the physical is being provided that really provided actionable events in our series. In order for point of care to provide a tangible clinical benefit, it res its results should be actionable and used to make decisions which lead to improved health care outcome. And systems like the COBAS layout offer us the potential of offering us testing in areas in which we've historically been limited. I'm citing a very, very well-known quote by Harry Gallus and the folks in the University of North Carolina over, well over 20 years ago, 1999, in which the authors noted that central to the concept of empiric management is uncertainty regarding the diagnosis. The role that we have in the laboratory to help be part of the larger clinical picture to impact patient care is a real role. And our data set proves that, that the data that's delivered from the laboratory is used to make clinical decision and the data that's provided by laboratorians makes a difference. So with that, the barriers to implementation are probably a discussion point to be had in a separate discussion. What is the cost of this testing? How do we look at surge capacity? Where do we see testing evolving from? But clearly our experience has shown us that the actionable events in the emergency department with access to rapid influenza testing changed practice management. So with that, we feel we've got a new test on the market, a new system on the market that offers us an advantage we've never had before in the fight against influenza. Um, there are many ways to tackle influenza and now we believe we have another diagnostic tool on the forefront. So with that, I wanna thank everybody for their time, their discussions and allowing me to share our data set with you today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Hansen, for that interesting presentation, bringing that information to us about flu and flu testing. Before we get started with audience questions, I just want to remind our attendees how to reach us today. Questions can be sent via the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. And you know, hopefully we can get to as many questions as we can. If we don't, and we'll definitely follow up with you um, via email. So let me just check in our, uh, give our audience just a minute to uh, type in questions, see what they have to say. Okay. I'm not seeing anything from the audience, but that's okay. I'm sure we'll get follow-up via email. The presentation will be available on demand. I'd like to pass it back to Dr. Hansen and ask him if he has any final thoughts or comments on today's topic. Sure. Um, I think that one of the things that I would stress is the opportunity for clinical communities to get together to look at the way in which our testing is delivered to patients. Um, I think our experience is just one experience, but it certainly influenced the way in which we feel that influenza in our emergency department really needs to be examined. And we're entering into frontiers here that are new for the laboratory. So I think it's important that we look at with a critical eye of new tests that come on the market. We ask very important clinical questions, but also larger questions about where our healthcare dollars are best spent. Uh, this is an exciting time for the laboratory as new platforms come to the market, uh, and this is just one of them. So I encourage you uh, uh, those of us in the field to talk to each other, uh, to share experiences and to ask questions. Uh, it's clearly not a one size fits all uh, discussion. So experiences from other people are helpful in the discussion of how we test for flu in the influenza season, uh, where we commit to spend our healthcare dollars and so forth. So uh, that would be my final thought for the, for the entire community here. Good thoughts, good to hear Dr. Hansen. Thank you again for sharing your time with us. I also wanna thank our sponsor, Roche Diagnosis, for making it possible to bring this presentation to you. And 
As I said before, today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through February 2016. You'll receive an email from LabRoots to let you know when it's available for on-demand and posted on LabRoots.com. We welcome you to forward this announcement to any colleagues who were not able to join in today in the live event. Thank you again for logging on and participating in today's broadcast seminar. See you next time.